This week on Death of the Reader, a literary critic turned novelist tries to tear the genre down with a Benson murder case, and Flex and Herds are here to catch it as it collapses. You're listening to Death of the Reader here on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds bringing you your murder mystery world tour as we take you around all of the best murder mystery in history. Mm-hmm. We've gone everywhere. We've gone France. We've gone England. And now we're all the way over in, in comfy America we'll, for our next we'll book. Be, we'll be elsewhere eventually. But Hopefully. We have, to, we have to trace those inspirations to get there. I want to get to China at some point. That's where I want to go. Yeah, My no, I'm very excited to get to those Eastern mysteries mm-hmm, at some mm-hmm. point. But yep. this week we are tackling the Benson murder case yes. by S.S. Van Dyne. Yes. I, I hope you're enjoying this one. I figured I'd go hunt down a novel that you might uh, thoroughly enjoy. I know how much you love the chase, the puzzle, the hunt. I figured, Flex, that this would be right up your alley. Oh, you (laughs) have me a marked man, sir. Van Dyne, we came to from Anna Catherine Green because Mm. they were kind of American contemporaries, you know, early 20th century writers, murder mystery both mm-hmm. kind of roughly based out of New York. But one of the difficulties with S.S. Van Dyne is that he was so secretive about his early writing career that it's very hard to actually trace who inspired mm. him. Yeah. At least up until the point where he spoils another author's book in the middle <laughs> of one of his, then you easily know who he's read. And then you regret everything. Because yes. now we can't do that book. We can't do that book now. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's funny watching uh, Van Dyne or, or trying to trace his novels, which is he was so financially successful, and yet it's... I've never heard anyone mention him in in my life, like up until looking into this show and and fairly recently. Yeah, it's so strange because by numbers, he is America's Agatha Mm. Christie, but he has just disappeared from pop culture in a way that Agatha Christie has absolutely not. It's very strange. I wonder why. These are the mysteries. These are the true mysteries of the show. I guess the thing I wanted to open the show talking about was Van Mm. Dyne himself because he's a fascinating character. He was basically an academic, you know, magazine writer and yeah. editor. Mm. Um, basically, his publications were, you know, very highbrow kind mm. of writing. Yes. Um, highbrow is definitely the term I would use. Mm. My goodness. The detective in this novel is wonderful. But we'll, yes. we'll get to him. But basically, the man, as many rich people in early 20th century America may have had, mm. he had a cocaine addiction. Yes. This is the fun story of the Benson murder case. This is, to me, the most interesting part is that, it, like, not the story itself, but the the whole reason it got put together was that I believe his his psychologist was like, "Hey, you have this awful cocaine addiction. You need to find something to occupy your mind." And Van Dyne, he said, "Yo, why don't you try these murder mystery novels?" And 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 Van Dyne or or uh, Willard Wright said, "Well, that's all very, you know, very pop culture. I don't think I could quite get into that." But he started reading them, and then he eventually decided to write a very highbrow murder mystery with the most highbrow of highbrow detectives mm. that lived on this high side of, of Brow, Brow Street. Um, <laughs> the terrifying. interesting thing about uh, Van Dyne compared to other murder mystery authors is you hear a lot of murder mystery authors talk about how they kind of start the book and they don't really know who's going to be the mm. culprit by the end. Yeah. Whereas Van Dyne planned six yes. books before yes. he put pen to page for he- his first one. And it was based off an actual murder case, Mm -hmm. the death of uh, Mr. Elwell in New York, whose death was unsolved and the circumstances were near identical to the ones in this book. Um, It is interesting that uh, S.S. Van Dyne, the character, uh, as S.S. Van Dyne is a pseudonym he uses, uh, the character actually references the murder case that the book is based off and says that the, the murder happened after the book as though yep. he's claiming credit for history, which I really, it's, I really love. The entire setup for this novel is ridiculous. Like, as we say, it's very, like, well-planned out and analytical and all those sorts of things. We also have our first instance of an author um, integrating themselves into the novel. And, and he not, integrates himself so hard. He does. He does. Um, not in the sense that his character is a detective, which would have been a blunder on his part, but in the sense that he's there as the... Uh, you know, the, the chronicler, the, the person who sits down with the book and takes down all of the wacky adventures of Mr. Philo Vance. He, he is the it's Watson beautiful. if you took all of the fun parts out of Watson. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I suppose going on from that, we should talk about Philo Vance and S.S. Van Dyne because oh. they are incredibly unlikable They're men. They're insufferable. They I hate are, them. Why are we reading this novel? They are utterly insufferable. <laughs> the, thing, the thing about this book, if I had to sum up this book in as few sentences as possible, I would have to say 
that it is either so self-aware it's incredible or so blind it's double-blinded itself into self-awareness. I'd agree with that. Yeah, that's about that's about right. Everything comes across as so incredibly pretentious and forthright that it it reads like a joke unless you know the context. One of the quotes that we found in researching this book was a critic who wrote that Philo Vance needs a kick in the pants. Hey, that was a Chandler, was it? I think so. I think so. I should find that. <laughs> <laughs> and by God, the man does. Yeah. It's funny that we, when we think of these sorts of characters in, in popular culture, mm. as I often think about the Robbie Downey Jr. Uh, impersonations of Sherlock Holmes, like characters like this, the so incredibly insufferable. They always know exactly what to say. They always say, you know, oh, I thought the solution to the mystery was positively simple. I had to figure it out in five to ten minutes. And you took a whole week of going about and talking to people. Awful. Awful. Usually those people have terrible character flaws. <laughs> the thing is, the thing is... Could I just a, pick up a murder mystery of a real dead person? Wouldn't that is, be fun, mummy? There's one line at the start of the book oh. where Van Dyne, the character, goes, I don't know why he chose me for his extra scholastic activities. And <laughs> it's like, probably because you both use that kind of language. <laughs> if I had to look at this book and say, why did Van Dyne write this story? Why did Huntington write this story this way? He was just angry with <laughs> poor people, dumb people, Yep. <laughs> Psychics. Yeah. Just, He's the, just list, up. the list goes he, on. He projects so hard onto Philo Vance yeah. in everything that he does. He says, well, isn't it, you know, isn't it silly that people spend so much time thinking about things that are incredibly simple and straightforward? He's awful. And, and the thing is, is when, when he's not projecting through Philo Vance, he's projecting through S.S. Van Dyne. <laughs> yeah. So it he just jumps back ends. between the two of them. It's perfect. Oh, yeah. And, and everyone else is just an idiot. It, it is horrible in that if you knew these people, I would I would tell you to see a psychologist. Yes. If you if you called yourself friends with these people, you need help. Mm -hmm. But I loved reading it. Get some better friends. Get some non pretentious friends. Get some friends <laughs> like down in the dumps. Go to a bar, meet a nice lady or man or other, and just have a good time. You just know? be careful that you don't accidentally end up shot in your apartment, like one that's, Alvin Benson. That's why we stay away from apartments. We go to the nightclubs. You're yes. very safe there. That's what I hear. So Alvin Benson yes. was found murdered in his home, sitting down with most of his clothes off and a lady's belongings lying around the place. Non-suspicious belongings. Non-suspicious belongings. Definitely not a woman who did this. I did want to talk about the fact that we are back to being frustrated with women again. Going yep. back to that list of things that Van Dyne hates, yep. women seem to be on there. We kind of took a break with Anna Catherine Green and, you know, we started with a break from Ronald Knox, but, you know... Golden Age era detective fiction was before feminism and God, it shows. Yep. I hope you're ready for the rest of this novel. The way that he talks about women in relation to the crime, it is ridiculous. Philo yeah. Vance, not, not a ladies' man. Yeah, <laughs> in I mean, any if, sense of the word. If you're getting into Golden Age detective fiction not this crime, one. you should know what you're in for, and that yep. is disrespect on many, many yes. groups of people. Yes. Because um, that was kind of the way of the era, and you know, there's there's nothing you can really do to change that. Yeah. I mean, that's a broader discussion on, on recreating old works for modern times, but mm. yeah. So Muriel St. Clair <laughs> is a, you know, well-to-do sort in New York City, an actress singer who has her belongings found in the victim's house. Mm. Her alibi is incredibly flaky. And the question is, how could it be anyone but her? It couldn't have been a woman. A woman couldn't have done it. Why, Philo Vance? Because a woman couldn't have done it. What? <laughs> now, I'll tell you I'll tell you coming up in the latter part of the show why I think that that sentence is uh -huh. accurate if flawed. Uh-huh. Sure. But yeah, the, the evidence against her seems tantamount, and it's very hard to pick through uh, using the layman's brain as far mm, as Philo Vance is concerned, how it could be done by anybody else. Well, you need to think about it psychologically, not with hard evidence or facts mm. or witnesses. You have to think about the psychology of it. Well, that was another really strange aspect to this story is that <laughs> there is so much talk of psychology and analyzing the way that people think. But the first time we sit down, in fact, both times we sit down with suspects mm. and talk with them, we skip half the conversation. Now, Herds, you remember those uh, Ten Commandments of Father Knox that we've discussed so much on this show? Ah, uh, yes. Far too many of them, in fact. Yes. Now, t too many of them? Too many. Ten is too many. Why can't there just be one or two I or three? Have, I have terrible news for you. Oh, no. Van Dyne 
wrote 20 plus appendices. That's too many. That's just too many rules. We'll That's like 30 plus this. rules. <laughs> we'll be talking about this coming up a bit later on the show. <laughs> Good luck. This is Death of the Reader. This is Death of the Reader on 2SER. We are Flex and Hers, and we are here with the powerhouse that is Jeff Field, your news director here at 2SER, responsible for keeping Sydney informed through the week on what's happening all around the world. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Felix, and I'll pay you later. What an introduction. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, look, can I, first of all, can I compliment uh, you guys for Death of the Reader? Because I feel we live in a day and age of people scrolling. I get on a train. I people, see people scrolling. I go into the newsroom. I see pe- not our newsroom, of course. I see people <laughs> scrolling. So no one is actually taking time. Though actually lots of people are taking time, but too many people just scroll through headline after headline. And you know what? I love a good book. <laughs> Whenever I go on holidays, I switch off social media. But you're going to hate me for this because I read biographies. Oh, no. But you may well switch me here because, I, you know, the, what we're about to talk about has got me intrigued. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's a pleasure to have you on, Jeff. I heard that you were excited to talk about S.S. Van Dyne or Willard Huntington Wright and all the wonderful things he's gotten up to, such as addiction, such as a wonderful family life, such as writing murder machine novels. You've got me in. <laughs> I think one of the most interesting things I want to kick off, just a little factoid out on the table, is there is a 1992 biography of S.S. S. Van Dyne by John Lowehy, which is absolutely fascinating. I've been picking my way through it, and like it, it just goes through fact after fact after fact. It has me sitting there like, is this man even real? Mm. The opening preface of the book says that the author had difficulty finding out details about his life because he intentionally wrote letters to mislead people as to who he was. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the first things I did when Felix said to me, he said, do you want to be on Death of the Reader? And I, I, I yes, but... <laughs> I was honest and I said, I'm not into detective fiction. I'm a real biography person, probably because I've worked in radio stations where I've met lots of celebrities and I want to actually find out if they're as off the planet as they appear to be when they come into the radio station. And in most cases, yes. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. However, I've got to say, this has really pricked my interest because I've had a look, I have, I'll be honest, I haven't read his books but I think I want to. I think I want to download or go into a bookstore and buy one because I was reading the Washington Post and this is what really, first of all, got my attention. Wright was one of the oddest ducks one could ever hope or dread to meet. For most of his brief life, he was a peripheral figure in American literacy and artistic circles, a smart, erudite, controversial man who never managed to achieve the intellectual respectability he craved. When fame eventually came to him, he was the author of popular detective novels. Now, let me just tell the listeners that he started off being a critic, slamming detective novels, and he ended up being a man that wrote detective novels. And his personal life, that in itself is enough to make me buy his books. He was basically a mess. He uh, divorced, well, lots of people divorced, but he divorced two people. I won't go into all the details. He was a drug addict. Uh, That didn't kill him, but addiction to brandy ended up killing him at the tender age of 51. Mm. And uh, I find it fascinating, Felix and Ben, that he was so critical. Like I read a few things and I went, whoa, a few things he said about detective novels, which like probably would have put me off reading them. And then he went on to achieve his golden moments by writing detective novels. How's that for juxtaposition? He was credited as being the most zealous literary critic of his time. He was fierce. Absolutely ripped into everything that was pop culture. But the thing that I really love is that because he was so engaged and absolutely critical of detective fiction, when he got into it, he knew what he was doing. Mm. Can I ask you guys, okay, for someone like me that has admitted that I only read biographies, that makes me a voyeur, I know. I, 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 and, and my partner does read fiction mm. and detective novel. He loves reading about Venice murders and things like that. What would be the one that I should start with? I've got to pitch you between two stories here. Mm-hmm. Now, one of them Herds here is more familiar with because he is the veteran going through it. It's I'm true, only true. partway through this book. And the other one I've read all the way through. 
Now, Herd's The Benson Murder Case, to me, stands out as something that is absolutely self-projection. Yes, this is the reason why we love The Benson Murder Case, because it's not just a story about some characters. It is Wright putting himself into a murder mystery novel and saying, this is how I do it better. And his ego, his incredibly inflated ego, is on full display. If you want to see the closest approximation of Wright's actual character, read The Benson Murder Case. It is perfectly an example of that. Yeah. And on the other hand, I would pitch to you the Kennel murder case, which is that blend of his incredible ego, coupled with a bit of learning of how the audience responds to his works, a bit more humanity portrayed through it, but still intrinsically him. I mean, the man had, can I say it on air? The man had balls. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think one of the other most fascinating things about getting into his actual novels is that he's obviously been a very zealous literary critic. He's obviously very forthright. He's obviously got the balls, as you say, Mm. Jeff. But then when we actually get to reading his novels, we aren't sure reading them whether he's so self-aware that it's enlightenment or whether he's so utterly blind (laughs) as to how he's carrying himself that he double-blinds himself into self-awareness, which is something you'll hear us say a lot on the coming weeks of the show. (laughs) And and, and the other layer of what you just said, Mm. of that, in itself to try and work your way through that is he was also on drugs and an alcoholic. (laughs) So that just makes it even more of a mystery. Mm. Wow. He is one hell of a subject that you've got me in for. To me, that was crying out for help. Mm. And look, this is why I want to read his stuff. Not because he was a drug addict, but because he fascinates me already from, you know, I read that Washington Post review, John, Lower he? Is that correct? Correct. Uh, I read that and that was enough to make me think, okay, I might go to the other side and buy some fiction. (laughs) That's good. I'm glad that we've convinced you at least that far, Uh, Jeff. You know, (laughs) he's like, in so many cases, he confuses me. And as I think the word juxtaposition really suits this man in every aspect of his life, whether it's hiding his name, whether it's being a critic of a genre that eventually was his living. <laughs> I mean, that would be like me saying, I can't stand news or newsreaders. <laughs> it, it's just like a crazy thing. And, and his life seemed, he seemed to be a very conflicted person. Dying at 51. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that the point that you make that he he obviously has this like crying out for help and he wants his attention, but he can't show himself using his novels and using Philo Vance and even inserting himself. This is another fun thing about the, the Benson murder case. He inserts himself as a character into the novel as Van Dyne. And all of these things are examples of how he, he's trying to create a legend around this detective and this murder mystery fiction without putting himself on the main stage, building that, that story. Maybe is more important to him than anything else. So after he died was like, okay, someone like David Bowie dies and there's an immediate like, hail David Bowie, everyone Mm. gets his music out. Was there sort of a lapse between him dying and people actually appreciating his work or him coming onto the radar of the literary world? Well, he was very successful while he was still alive. He made a lot of money and and died to the, you know, Mm. brandy addiction, obviously. He must have been pretty well, well off in that regard. I don't- Brandy's not cheap. It's not cheap. No, it's- yeah, so we're told. Not any experience there. I don't but know. Uh, <laughs> I haven't found anything about his death making big waves. I haven't seen no. a huge amount of attention on that. I think that he made his splash while he was still alive and then he faded basically out of existence. Um, there are still those 20 rules, the the Van Dyne's, uh, you know, 20 rules of detective fiction that we have to, to roll off of. But I don't think that there was a huge conundrum about it, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean, he died in 1939, which means he was fronting up right to the war. Yeah, I think the other thing, and this is not something that I can be terribly confident in saying because we haven't read the final six novels of the 12 novel Philo Vance series. Too many. But he planned the original six and then the latter six kind of came at a whim more or less. And I think, according to some critics I've read, he his lack of passion started to show itself going into those final six novels. Mm. So by the time he passed away in 1939, people weren't as fond of yeah. Philo Vance. Yeah, I, sure. I get that. Well, either way, this has been Death of the Reader. We've been talking with your news director, Jeff Field. Jeff, thank you very much for joining us thank on you. the show. It's been my pleasure. And uh, well done again for keeping the art of reading alive because (laughs) I feel I see too many people on their phones, read people, read, 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 and listen to this podcast. Thank you very much, Jeff, for the 
resounding endorsement. Okay. We will carry on with our discussion of if the Benson murder case is fair thus far, how I think I can solve it, up next on Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader here on 2SER, and it's time, Herds, to solve the Benson murder case. Well, it's time for you to solve it. Yeah, I yes. get to sit here and know exactly what's going on. That's and true. mislead you like some kind of crazy criminal mastermind. We have read from chapters one to eight, which is a third of the way through the book, as we normally yeah. do. Yeah. And, Herds, I reckon this is the most in the bag we have it. This is the easy one? This <sighs> is the easy Easy one. Are you kidding me? And I'll tell you why. It's because of Van Dyne's 20 rules, which we touched on right at the end of the first section of the show. Now, the 20 rules that Van Dyne wrote, you can get a full rundown of them on the podcast. Mm. Uh, But basically, they go into great detail about what Van Dyne thinks makes a detective story good. Well, you know, they'd only be helpful if you spent the time reading through the eight chapters and then cross-referencing each chapter with each of the 20 rules. Herds, I did that. So, basically, we have Muriel St. Clair, Captain Lecoq, who is most definitely 100%ly named after Emile Gaborio's detective of a similar name. Can you spell influence? There's also a Moriarty on the character's list. I'm excited to meet him. Excellent. Uh... And Major Benson, first of all, he is motively connected to the crime. Second of all, he is an army major, same as Captain Lecoq, Mm, mind you. And the weapon is described as an army cult. Okay. All right. Third of all, we've spent a decent bit of time talking about his relationship with his brother. Okay. And finally, we have that glorious scene where uh, Major Benson comes up while they're sitting down at the club and goes, oh, by the way, by the way, Markham, Uh, Here's a guy that I didn't think of. We know that the person that was in the house that shot Benson, according to the circumstantial evidence, which is irrelevant according to Philo Vance, but whatever. It is. It's irrelevant. Why even use it as reasoning? So the the person must have gotten in by either being let in or by having a key. Mm. And there are only two characters with a key. One of them is the dead Benson. One of them is Mrs. Platt's. Mm. Now, on a list of characters who have keys and are alive, there is a very small number of people (laughs) that could have closed up the the crime scene. Fair enough, fair enough. Which means that despite the rule that Mrs. Platts cannot be the culprit, that does not disabuse her from being Mm. an accomplice. You think she's an accomplice? I most definitely do. They make her seem like such an accomplice too. She's the first character we get an interrogation scene with, right? Mm. And when Philo Vance is sitting down with her, She's the one that gets all nervous when she says, did we have any visitors? Mm. Mm, Because who could have let any visitors in that was alive, Herds? Mm. Um, And that leaves the suspect list as a grand total of one, maybe two characters. Mm. And one of which we haven't met and was only mentioned by the other suspect. Mr. uh, Mr. Fife? Yes, Mr. Fife. Yeah. We also, I think that we we can't get, you know, swapped corpses or anything because it's a clean shot through the forehead, which means that the face is entirely intact and the mm. body is very obviously dead and has gone to the mortuary and through several police officials. So, like, all of the standard tricks are out the gate. The only thing we have is who let them into the building and who they were. Mm, fair enough. I am very excited to see where this novel goes from here mm. um, because so far it has not thrown any suspicion the way of the Major other than saying that the brothers did not get along mm. and having him show up and having him being the first character mentioned in the story, and, you know, this list is getting surprisingly long, Ben. (laughs) Shall I keep going? I mean, if you want to, really. And having him call Markham and ask him to Mm -hmm. assist in the crime, almost Mm -hmm. as though the legal man would not be very good at using evidence to actually put a case together. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's also, you know, he's he's the highest-ranked army character in the story. Mm -hmm. He's got that army cult. There's also the fact that uh, Benson had his clothes off, and if we're assuming that it wasn't the woman, why would Benson get his clothes off for another woman's husband? That is an excellent question. And we know that their business as brothers, whilst it was, you know, going well, it seems like they're not the most ethical on the street, and an army major not having Mm. strong ethics? You know, either that's a criticism of army majors, or, you know, maybe the one who's really pulling the strings in the business has just found himself dead on the chair in his apartment. But Herds... 
I've been speaking for a while here. You have. You've been enjoying... You are stewing on the other side of the table with unrivaled confidence. I've never seen you come to a case <laughs> with such determination to defeat me as I see across from the table now. Look, I've just been letting you go on and on because you enjoy the sound of your own voice, clearly. That is true. That's why you talk so much. But I'm, I'm here to tell you that you are, in fact, incorrect, sir. Incorrect. The major is entirely out of the picture. I don't know why you would fall for such a clever ruse. Uh, on on the part of uh, Mr. Right here, so okay, I'll let this play. I'll let this play out. So here's the thing: I think that the rule that you're referencing in terms of cutting out, uh, particularly the the policemen who are assisting in the case, uh, is, is number eleven. Uh-huh. Uh, Characters such as the butlers, footmen, valets, gamekeepers, cooks, and the like uh, must not be chosen by the author's culprit. Uh, there is nothing explicitly about the policeman, and, and most importantly, uh, the the Watson character, which we could we could argue is maybe Van Dyne themselves. Are you trying to say or, that our perspective? Are we breaking Knox's no, rule that we cannot when, follow the thoughts? No. Okay. No, I'm not saying that Van Dyne is the culprit because they wrote the books, and that wouldn't make any sense. But you know what does make sense? That would be a good twist, though. That I would be an excellent that. twist. I'm sad that I didn't go with that one, but <laughs> Markham. Well, looking out after yeah, it from the and, inside. And you're, technically, the you're guy right. who brought us on the case is with us every step of the way. He's in every single scene we go in. Yeah, technically, you're right. Having he conversations is, with the other policemen slightly off screen. I'm just saying. He is the district suspicious. attorney. And, he is. You know, now that I think about There's it, there's even a note in the book that says that the district attorney is like no longer the attorney by his, the time of the, the his, sixth book. I his think. willing stupidity, at least as far as Philo Vance is concerned, would actually make sense if he's just trying to lead Philo Vance down a wild goose chase. Yeah. He's failing horribly, but he's trying. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. It sounds like rubbish. So that note, right? Uh-huh. Earlier in the book, talk about how the, the district attorney, it's a shame that they're no longer the district attorney. This, how are you friend, turning this on its head? This is foreshadowing. Oh. For six books. You know how we wrote six books oh, in a row? Oh, no. This is foreshadowing. <laughs> but the sixth book, when the district attorney is finally out, is being the mastermind of all of these crimes. Uh, so you think this is all some big scheme over the I next do. six books? This is why Van Dyne or Will Wright is so well regarded because he wrote this six book. I don't know what that is. Not a trilogy, a hex, hexology? Who even knows? Sounds right. Hexology. He wrote this hexology <laughs> with Markham, the Watson character, being secretly the killer from the very beginning. You and know, that's how it plays out. Dude, that's it. The thing is, I don't believe you because that sounds so good. That would be fantastic. Somebody <laughs> write that. I mean... <laughs> Thank you for writing that, Will Huntington, right? Good work, Van Dyne. You did it. Ugh. I'm just saying. You know, oh, man. Marco would be the perfect culprit for this novel. The, the thing is, is there's a lot of clues I think that you're letting slide in there. No, I'm not. Like, the only clue that could throw out the window if he's secretly a woman dressing as a man, but that's, you know, a whole other well, thing. I, I don't even think that's true. I think that what you've done then is said that every clue is an intentionally laid red herring, which is, mind you, mm-hmm. foreshadowed by mm-hmm. that discussion between Philo Vance and Markham. Mm-hmm. By Markham. Markham's the one. is nonetheless, uh, you know, a, a very, very long drawer of one's long bow. And where are we in the world? In England. That's where the longbow is from, and that's where we are. Inspired by. See, I made it come all the way back around. We're inspired by England detective fiction because uh, they had the course, longbow. That's what they're course. known for. Oh. They're over the Battle of Agincourt. Hurts. <laughs> Shout out to history. You know, this is one of the few times that I've come away from one of your theories. Aside, aside from, you know, non-mystery theories. Uh-huh. Where I've been thinking to myself, I wish I was wrong. I wish. I wish where's I the, was wrong. Where's the fishing hook in this story? We need one of those. Where's the old man to scale the walls of the apartment? Maybe that's what <laughs> Markham take, did. And take he the shot. Climbed thing. up and shot oh. an army called through the iron bars. <laughs> yeah, that's it, dude. There was a there was a gun on the mantelpiece and it was loaded for some reason because you know <sighs> Benson likes his guns loaded. And then the old man came up outside and pulled. The, I wasn't an army cult. I was a thirty-eight. It doesn't matter. Smith and West. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it was it a 45 matter. army cult. It doesn't matter. Your theory is falling apart. <laughs> just you. What chapters are we doing matter. next episode? <laughs> <laughs> we are doing chapters 9 to 18. So we're on the we're on a long stretch. But I promise you the chapters are slightly shorter than, than the current ones. So Ugh. it should even out. Should all even out perfectly. The end of chapter 18. We'll see you all on uh, Death the Reader. Your are going to World Tour. <laughs> Thank you for joining Next us. Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. And we're out.